So we have uh, three panelists this afternoon, each of whom in a different way is going to speak to how we can connect the movements, how we can learn from each other, support each other, and make common cause. And our first speaker is State Senator Jamie Eldridge. Jamie has been a state legislator since 2002. Before being elected to the legislature, he was a public interest lawyer in the fields of housing, social security, disability, and unemployment law. He created the Community Development Justice Project in Lowell to help build affordable housing, start new businesses, and create new nonprofits to address local problems. He has been a leader in the state legislature in these and other progressive issues. And his mission this, uh, this afternoon is to speak on the people's budget. And you have in your packets a page, two pages, actually, on the people's budget, one on the budget itself and one on the campaign for the people's budget. Jamie Eldridge. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I know that many of you have been here all day, and I want to thank uh, Cole Harrison and everyone involved with Mass Peace Action and all the other coalition members for putting on together a sustainable security conference. And it's a great honor to be here and with uh, my fellow panelists. And I'm, I'm here, as, as Cole said, to talk about the, the people's budget. and. My guess is most people here are very familiar with, with that proposal, but, but basically it's, it's been an effort, at least in Massachusetts, where for the past four years there has been a, a push by Mass Peace Action uh, to propose what in, in some years has been called budget for all, this year has been called the people's budget. Uh, for as far as Massachusetts goes, in, in, in my capacity as a state legislator, to ask the Massachusetts legislature to endorse the people's budget and, and ask our congressmen and women to, to support this budget and, and really create a very different dynamic at the federal level. Um, I'm just going to read very briefly what the proposal is. And for those of you, I, I think it's in your packet, but the, the bill, the state bill, is Senate 1906 and House 3144, filed by Senator Jason Lewis and Representative Jay Livingstone. And uh, the question uh, calls on Congress to enact a budget for prosperity. Uh, preventing cuts to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and veterans benefits, or to housing, food, and unemployment assistance, create and protect jobs by investing in manufacturing, schools, housing, renewable energy, transportation, and other public services, provide new revenues for these purposes, and to reduce the long-term federal deficit by closing corporate tax loopholes, ending offshore tax havens, and raising taxes on incomes over $250,000, and uh, in, in many ways, most importantly, uh, redirect military spending to these domestic needs by reducing the military budget, ending the war in Afghanistan, and bringing U.S. troops home safely now. So that is the proposal before the legislature. I'm, I'm a strong supporter of that and working to get that passed. It should be noted that, that uh, the budget that was, I think, just voted on in, in either the spring or summer, um, that Congresswoman Clark, Congressman Capuano, and Congressman McGovern did vote for, for that budget. So I want to um, give them a round of applause for supporting the people's budget. And I, I just want to say that, <clears throat> you know, just in the, the past month, just a, a few quick examples of, of what I see at the state level that really f reflects that in, unless we're really serious about redirecting our federal budget priorities, it's very difficult to create change here, here, here in the Commonwealth among, amongst ourselves and in the communities in Massachusetts. So I know there's a lot of uh, allies out there that I work with on, on a number of issues. Um, just a, f a few quick examples, and, and most of these are, are from my district, is um, a few weeks ago I got a call from a constituent who uh, she uh, and her husband and two kids, uh, their apartment, uh, burned down in the city of Marlboro uh, due to a fire in the apartment building. And uh, she, she was homeless. Um, she went to the state to apply for support in order to, to stay in a hotel she, until she could find a new place to live. Um, the state uh, denied her uh, housing um, emergency assistance because there is a clause in the state policy that if you have been fired from a job within the past 90 days, somehow that means you're not eligible for emergency shelter. Now, as absurd as that is, you know, so much of that is tied to the, the federal cuts that have happened 
over the past 20 years at the federal level to building affordable housing, to better supporting public housing. And so what we have now in Massachusetts is an affordable housing crisis and a homelessness crisis. On any given night, there's about 4,000 families that are leaving either in shelter or hotels, off, often unacceptable places for kids to, to be raised or, or to live in. And, and a large part of that, uh, and, and there's a lot of stories about it in Boston, but it's throughout the state, um, it's very difficult to find affordable housing, even, even for, for uh, families where both parents are, are working. So that's something that I've been working on, but the reality is, is that that policy uh, is unlikely to change until we reverse our federal budget priorities. I, I think a lot of people here have probably been advocating for the past few weeks, uh, perhaps the whole year, on making sure that Massachusetts continues on a sensible and progressive solar policy and making sure that we provide the proper investment to make sure that we not only expand solar, but do our part to reduce global warming and combat climate change. And what happened in the legislature this year, this week, which was, which was an embarrassment, was that we, we could not get to an agreement on moving forward on continuing that support. And so right now we have an uh, uncertain environment as far as how we're going to move forward to support many of the solar projects that are about to be built, uh, but, they, but they're, they're, the, the funding is uncertain. A big piece of that is that right now there is a federal solar tax credit that's going to expire next year. Because it takes about nine months to, to build any solar project, we need that state legislation to pass. But, but again, so much, so much of this urgency is because it's really uncertain at the federal level if that, if that tax credit is going to continue, which pays for about 30 percent of the cost of solar projects. So you think about that. If that tax credit goes away, how much harder is it going to be at the state level and in, in throughout Massachusetts to continue to invest in solar? Um, if we could keep that tax credit full going, which, which obviously includes federal funding, we can make sure we have a, a more stable environment to, to make sure that Massachusetts stays the lead in, in uh, not only solar policy but, but combating climate change. So that's something that I, I think if we had the people's budget, we would have a much, much more secure environment for, for uh, supporting solar. Um, and then uh, also uh, one of the other issues that I, I work on is uh, better supporting uh, immigrants and better uh, combating uh, some of the injustices we say based on, on race or ethnicity in Massachusetts. I, I think probably a lot of us uh, read and heard the news about the statements by Governor Baker uh, questioning whether we should continue to accept Syrian refugees in Massachusetts, which were embarrassing, and a lot of us called him out on it, and it was a tremendous rally last night uh, in front of the State House, um, which was terrific. <laughs> you know, part of that dynamic <clears throat> and, and I, I interact with a lot of constituents on issues is, is that there's a lot of people that somehow think that we can't continue to support refugees because we have all these domestic needs in, in our country. Now, putting aside the fact that, in, 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 embarrassingly, the United States is really not doing very much to welcome many refugees in, in compared to, to many European countries and many uh, countries in the Middle East. Um, Part of that is that a, a lack of understanding by a lot of the public about how much of the, of the United States federal budget goes to the military and therefore how it squeezes out domestic spending, which, which could take care of a whole number of needs, whether for the elderly, uh, for the poor, and, and, and therefore the, the, the backlash often tends to be against uh, communities of color, against immigrants, in this case against refugees. And one of the conversations I've been having with my constituents is trying to make that point of do you realize that over 50 percent of the federal budget is going to the military? And that's been the case for decades. And that actually if we, if we change, that, if we change that, that prioritization at the federal level, we could take care of the needs uh, not only of, of, of those who grew up in this country, but for everyone who lives in Massachusetts and, and across this country. Part of having that conversation, I think, is, is communicating to the public and obviously to our congressmen and women about the, the, the need to reverse our, our, our priorities at the federal level and make sure that we support something like the people's budget. And so I, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is. I, I think that sometimes some of my colleagues question, well, why are, we, why are we pushing for this resolution to send a message to our congressmen or women? And a big part of it is, is education, is a lot of people don't realize how much money is spent 
for the U.S. military versus domestic purposes. They don't realize about the cuts to housing, to the environment, to social services at the federal level, and how therefore that's fallen at the state shoulders. And although the state is trying to do its part, we know that unfortunately in Massachusetts, uh, there have been a series of tax cuts that has reduced our ability to provide all these services. So um, I can't emphasize the importance enough um, to gather support for the people's budget at the state level, and obviously for everyone here to talk to your congressmen and women about the, the importance of them voting for this so that it's not just three of our congressmen and women, but also every single congressperson in Massachusetts. So um, I want to thank everyone for being here. I look forward to answering questions, but I, I, uh, I can't emphasize the importance of this because, again, um, as much as there's a, a, a significant number of state legislators working for all these important priorities. One of the most heartbreaking things that, that I go through every, each and every year is sitting down and talking to advocates and people uh, that you know, may have uh, children with disabilities, uh, people that um, are suffering homelessness, people that are frustrated at the cuts that are happening in their public schools, is that unless we reverse our budget priorities at the federal and state level, very little is going to change. We're really just playing in the margins. Part of that solution is the people's budget and getting it supported and passed at the federal level. So uh, again, thanks very much for having me. I look forward to the questions, and it's an honor to be here with you today. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, next up is Chung Wa Hong. She is executive director of Grassroots International. And for a number of years before that was executive director of the New York Immigration Coalition, where she grew the membership into one of the largest, the nation's largest immigration rights groups. Uh, <clears throat> she played a crucial role in promoting immigration reform and was named by New York Magazine as one of the most influential people in politics. She has a long and varied record of activism on peace, healthcare, labor, and human rights issues. Chang Wa Hong. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Yeah. Are you kind of drowsy after lunch? <laughs> I'm glad we started with the song. Um, I am uh, so happy to be here at this conference. I, I cannot think of a more um, timely theme. Uh, 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 today um, to, to talk about then um, sustainable security. Um, I'm very humbled to be speaking in front of so many veterans, uh, veteran activists, and literally veterans who we heard from today. Um, uh, I'm very hopeful um, that a lot of the intersections made today will really energize our movement. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank Cole for all the just hard work. I can't uh, thank you so much. Um, just, just everything from just thinking so thoroughly through the themes and the speakers down to the parking permit um, at midnight. So um, thank you so much for that. And I want to do a, a quick shout out um, to two women who have also um, uh, uh, contributed greatly to the work of Grassroots International um, uh, by serving on the board for eight years each. Hayat Imam, do you want to just raise your hand? Yay, Hayat. And um, Catherine Hoffman here. Catherine, there she is. Um, so two warrior women who have uh, kept grassroots into, uh, kept uh, grassroots as a progressive, amazing, um, funder and an international solidarity organization. So Grassroots International is um, a group that accompanies social movements, uh, especially social movements in the global south that work for food, water, and land rights, um, as well as human rights and climate justice. So our partners are in Mesoamerica, Brazil, Haiti, Palestine, West Africa. Um, just so you have a sense of where we are. Um, we basically raise money from progressive donors here in the US and ship it directly to support the organizing work of these um, social movements. Um, in short, um, we fund the solutions, we fund the fighters. So I hope those of you who are interested will talk to me about that. 
Um, I was asked to address movement building, um, and in particular, um, uh, talk about movement building uh, 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 and what we can learn about movement building in the global context. Um, using some of the um, immigrant and global uh, examples. I'm going to talk about two examples. My first example is a woman named Berta Caceres from Honduras. Um, she is, she, I met her in the summer when I went to visit Central America and I was just so inspired and encouraged that there are leaders like Berta um, uh, working in the front lines. She's a leader of the indigenous community called the Lenca people in Honduras. And she, um, with her community, waged a, um, an amazing grassroots campaign that successfully kicked out uh, the world's largest dam builder. Um, and if the dam had gone uh, into effect, um, it would have submerged uh, thousands of indigenous people and have separated them from their sacred indigenous ancestral land. Um, it would have um, created all sorts of environmental havoc uh, because um, uh, this dam, like many other dams uh, that are being built, um, uh, are uh, to to facilitate uh, mining, um, producing a lot of um, you know poisoning the river um, and the areas in Honduras, uh, particularly after the 2009 coup uh, that happened uh, with U.S. support, I might add. Um, uh, the right-wing government that came into power uh, made it a priority to pull in mining industries, forestry, agribusiness, hydroelectric dams, to the point where about a third of the entire country is now given out in mining concessions. So we need to look at this as, you know, where is the cutting edge of the extractive economy that we're talking about that is destroying the earth? Um, this, uh, uh, this is where the cutting edge is. Um, so they're going to build this dam with uh, complete cooperation uh, from the government um, without any consultation with the, the native people um, as required by international law. Um, so they brought in all their bulldozers and machinery and uh, Berta organized her community and literally uh, blocked the path to the river with their bodies. They had set up a 24-7 um, monitoring um, so that everybody in the community would take shifts um, to, to prevent uh, the, the dam construction from happening. And so um, it was an intense fight. Uh, the government unleashed its military forces and the corporation, um, uh, uh, it's very easy to hire thugs and private security forces. Um, uh, and so they were up against the, the activists who are trying to protect the river. And I might add, this dam project, um, it's great to say it's th this dam project. <laughs> 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 it's, uh, um, but that's what it is, um, was um, uh, notably, uh, financed with millions of dollars uh, by the World Bank's private um, uh, private sector arm. Um, uh, so here we see a conflation of a lot of things coming together. Um, but that didn't stop um, Berta and her community from uh, fighting against this dam. Um, unfortunately, in the process, some of the community people were shot and killed, um, including a 15-year-old teenager um, who they suspect uh, was tortured and killed, um, uh, but the but the good thing is after organizing um, her communities, um, the dam decided to pull out. The dam company decided to pull out. Yes, um, and then um, the World Bank, the financing um, people, decided to pull out as well because of all the human rights uh, uh, bad reputation that they were getting. Um, but it's important to. Keep in mind, um, I learned a lot of lessons from this story and from Berta, and I think um, I wanted to uh, share them with you. 
Um, one is her clear analysis. This wasn't just about stopping a dam. She said, we must, this is um, her quote, when she won the Goldman Prize um, for environmental activism, she just won that this year. Um, she said, we must shake our conscience free of rapacious capitalism, racism, and patriarchy that will only assure our self-destruction. Um, she introduces herself as part of the Lenka people uh, who come from the earth, from water, from corn. Um, so from her, I learned that we, it is past time, the days during which we had one movement for the environment, another movement for people's survival, and another movement for peace are over. Um, her people are attached to her land. Um, uh, so protecting Mother Earth is the same as protecting uh, frontline communities. Um, and they're the peacemakers. Um, uh, so um, just learning that lesson was really powerful for me. Um, also, her organization and other groups um, that we support um, have a powerful um, vision uh, that is a uh, alternative to this overconsumption uh, growth economy, and they call it Buen Vivir. It's a philosophy and outlook um, that describes a new relationship uh, between people among themselves and people with nature. Um, it's, it's being in harmonious relationship, and it's living well, um, not living to the maximum consumption. Um, and the way that they do, these social movements do their work, uh, bring together um, various elements of what makes a vibrant movement. So they have a very strong sustainable livelihoods program through uh, actual farming practices, agroecology, food sovereignty. Um, they do movement building to organize their members. Um, and then at the same time, they restore the planet. Um, she also taught us we cannot depoliticize these struggles. Um, the fight for climate justice or the environment is not separate from fighting against the US backing a dictator who is pulling off military coups. They go together. Um, we cannot separate the financiers of the extractive economy um, from the environmental activism because the World Bank and the extractive economy go together. Um, and then I'll close with um, uh, uh, final words uh, with her example, um, where she said, let us come together and remain hopeful as we care for the earth. So she has um, uh, uh, also taught us the lesson of um, uh, the importance of cultivating hope. Um, that hope is not a feeling or a sentiment. It comes from the process of actively dismantling the destructive and building a movement um, uh, based on real community, um, community action. Um, I want to also um, talk about an example from my immigrant rights organizing. Um, one of the, um, which I think is also relevant um, in the global context, um, with the immigrant rights movement, I want to talk about how important it was for me to kind of, I did immigrant rights organizing and advocacy for about 20 years. And during that time, um, I saw the, uh, the evolution of how we saw ourselves as immigrants, who we are, and what we demanded, and how the movement went from asking for benefits during the 90s when the welfare reform was being passed, asking for equal benefits. Um, and then it went on to asking for civil rights and due process after 9-11. Um, and then we're well on our way into um, a broader vision of demanding immigrant justice. And I think that's a transformation that uh, was very powerful for me as the movement went through different phases. So for example, um, when we were having immigrant rights rallies um, uh, in the beginning, in the 90s or right after 9-11, a lot of immigrants came out with placards that says, we are not criminals, right? Because we were called criminals. And in the morning session, people also talked about how um, uh, people are criminalized. Because before you get attacked, you get criminalized and demonized. And then that's how it gets easy to attack you. Um, and so the dreamers um, took that on and first uh, came out and said, 
Do you remember these signs? It says undocumented, unafraid, unapologetic. Um, so they established who they were um, and how they felt about it. And after that, because they were unafraid, they unleashed a whole set of direct action, um, sit-ins, die-ins, um, getting arrested. Um, and as part of that process created a, a really um, uh, uh, galvanizing campaign that ended with education, not deportation. Um, and so, I think um, one of the one of the um, uh, one of the limitations um, that I think the immigrant rights movement has, despite all of those excellent campaigns, um, is that it has not adequately made the global connection. Uh, into looking at what are the root causes of global migration. So that's something that I look forward to um, continuing to work with immigrant communities about. So those are just some of the um, movement building um, uh, lessons and insights I wanted to share with you. Um, and if you want to engage in further participatory discussions on those topics, um, Hayat and I have a, uh, a workshop in the afternoon uh, with the same title. So we would welcome um, um, uh, further dialogue. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Chung Wa. Uh, we are joined by uh, Denise Simmons. She is a Cambridge City Councilor and a Massachusetts Peace Action Board member. Welcome, Denise. <clears throat> Uh, unfortunately, Arnie Alpert wasn't able to make it today, uh, but his colleague Will Hopkins can't, was able to make it down from New Hampshire. Um, Will is a lifelong New Hampshire resident who served for six years in the New Hampshire uh, National Guard. He was decorated for valor during his year-long tour in the infantry in Iraq, which included the Fallujah Offensive. He also served in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Will has been the chapter president of New Hampshire Iraq Veterans Against the War, and he is currently executive director of New Hampshire Peace Action. He works to strengthen ties between peace groups and veterans for peace. Uh, Will Hopkins. All right, so um, Cole said I could use part of this time as a commercial for my workshop, so I'll, I'll be quick with, it, with, with my addition to the, to the panel, which will be a little bit less insightful than theirs. Um, so we, we, uh, can we start with a show of hands? Who um, feels like uh, hope for the abolition of war in your lifetime, hope for meaningful climate legislation in your lifetime? Who feels like that's hopeless? Who feels hopeless here? Anybody, anybody feel like, the, like there's, there's limited chance of that happening? I'm glad to see so few hands, and I'm, I'm sad to see more hands going up, but, but let's put them all down now. Um, uh, <laughs> some, of your, some of you, us probably have less lifetime than others. <laughs> well, we so we don't know which ones they are. Um, so so we, we live in a world that, that's functioning on a model of global infinite growth capitalism. Uh, political candidates consistently talk to us about uh, you know, how we stimulate economic growth. Um, it, it depends on ever-expanding markets and the social prevalence of fear of the other, uh, a be the belief in patriarchy, white supremacy, uh, the demonization and blaming of those who do not have financial means, classism, um, is critical to maintaining this system of, of infinite growth, global capitalism. Um, you know, governments, not just our government that's run by, you know, you get the top 50% of uh, political donations in, in the federal budget being given by about 200 uh, individuals and corporations. Um, so you can't be taken seriously for political office if you don't have the backs of those Pentagon contractors, those bankers, those fossil fuel companies. Um, and this isn't a problem that's limited to the United States. It's a global issue um, where governments are doing the, the bidding of uh, those who have the financial means to get there. Um, uh, Increasingly, though, throughout humanity, the pretext of democracy and rule by the people um, and the reality that, that on some level at least, government is, uh, you know, needs the consent of the governed to function uh, is leading to an increased uh, leaning on propaganda as the only tool to keep this system in place. Well, not the only tool, um, but, but as a main tool of keeping that system in the place. 
Um, here in the U.S., we obviously have the largest uh, and most powerful military that humanity's ever known. We're spending more than three times what any other country is. Um, this is a system that has uh, an imperial system that has bases in over 100 countries around the world. Um, and essentially, in classical military for, uh, terms, can, can crush anything else out there. Um, so, uh, you know, that group uh, essentially is acting as the, and I'm going to use a term from the workshop I went to this morning, uh, as the guardian of global capitalism, uh, making sure that, uh, that, that this infinite growth model can continue to thrive. Um, fossil fuels are critical to every step of that process. Uh, they, they fuel the transportation, they, they, uh, uh, plastics are, are key to the markets. Um, it's something that uh, it can't function without fossil fuels, but it also can't function without racism. It can't fu function without patriarchy and sexism. It can't function without classism, thinking that some people are worth less than you and have less rights to water, freedom, uh, housing. Uh, these are, uh, are things that it absolutely needs. And, um, you know, I, I, a lot of people are hopeless because they don't see the kind of activism, particularly from my generation, which is the generation that came, comes just before Gen X, uh, that we, they think we need to get there. Um, but what a lot of people aren't seeing is that the generation that came up just behind me grew up in a very, very small world. Um, these are people who grew up teleconferencing and instant messaging with people in Iran, in Iraq, uh, all over the world. They've always had the internet and the ability to communicate and humanize everybody else. Um, when I look at um, the world today, uh, you know, obviously the U.S. is not engaged in the Middle East for no reason at all. We are fighting for the last of the ancient sunlight uh, and the energy that is tied up there because it's what the system of global capitalism needs. Um, to maintain this, uh, this infinite, infinite growth, that would have to last forever. That's not happening. To maintain it, uh, the dehumanization of the other would have to be kept. And that's not going to happen either, because we are, we are learning uh, to, be, to be better to each other. Um, and the world is getting smaller. Um, so I have enormous hope for where we're going as a people. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm guessing one or two of us might not make it to meaningful climate legislation or the abolition of war, but I'm hoping most of us can get there. Um, I really don't think that this movement is anywhere near as far away as we think it is. If somebody had told us 10 years ago that uh, all over the US homosexuals would be able to wed and that marriage equality would happen, we'd have told them they were crazy. And I think we are a lot closer to a moral revolution as a species uh, to decide that, that, that war is what, uh, what, <laughs> what people uh, all know it is. It's this uh, idea that rich and powerful people have the right to pit poor and powerless people against each other, to kill each other for control of resources. Everybody knows it. And we're getting there. Um, so now for the commercial for my workshop. My workshop is uh, going to be a, uh, a tactical one. Um, we're going to talk about a tactic called bird dogging. Uh, and Arnie Alpert was the one who was going to really focus on the commercial part of that. And he caught whatever uh, Dr. Chomsky had. Uh, but as I was getting, getting gas this morning at a gas station in New Hampshire, as I was walking out, there were about a half a dozen a little flock of presidential candidates who came up and were bothering, oh, can you vote for me, vote for me? And I told one of them to get in my car, and I brought him along. Um, so um, I would like to introduce Mr. Jefferson Lincoln, former president of the United States Society for Snack Soup Food Wholesalers. <laughs> Jefferson Lincoln. Thank you so much, Will. For the uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Cole. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much, Will, for the warm introduction. Um, is this on here? No. Uh oh. Is this one going to work for me? Try it. Try great. it. That's fabulous. Great. It is so great to see you here again. My, I want to thank you again, Will, for that introduction and uh, Massachusetts Peace Action for holding this conference. You know, I mean, peace is obviously an important thing, and action is, of course, something we all need. My name is Jefferson Lincoln. Um, I want just want to tell you a little bit about myself, and then I understand you've got a couple questions. I do. Good. All right. Excellent. So uh, anyway, I was born on a farm in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Uh, my dad raised dairy cows, but with the changes in the dairy industry, uh, he decided to participate in the dairy herd buyout program and we uh, ended up giving up our dairy herd and I, who would have loved to follow in his footsteps, uh, decided to take up zucchini farming. So 
So I started a zucchini farm on our land in Hillsborough. Uh, it was great because we were close to the land. We created jobs. We built prosperity. We paid our taxes. We paid decent wages to the farm workers. We obeyed the laws. And our business was successful. It took off. But I decided I wanted to do more. I wanted to get into a value-added product, and we developed a successful line of zucchini chips. And it became the best line of zucchini chips in the country. And through that work, that's how I got involved in the National Association of Snack Food Wholesalers. And I became that group's president. And in that role, I spent a lot of time in our nation's capital. And believe me, what I saw down there was not pretty. And that's why I've decided to come back to New Hampshire and put my name yesterday. I went to the Secretary of State's office and put my name on the ballot to be on the New Hampshire primary ballot as a candidate for President of the United States. And I think that democracy <laughs> is the value added of our political process. And that when we all get together, we can make changes. And that's why I hope you will go to jeffersonlincoln.com and make a contribution as large as is legally possible to my campaign and sign up to get involved. Thank you very much. Woo! Now, I understand, Will, that you've yes. got so uh, uh, thank you, those of you who submitted questions today. Um, the, the first question from our audience is, how do you feel about climate change? Oh my goodness, I feel terrible about climate change. And I mean, the environment, just think about it. Where would we be without it? Yeah. <laughs> the second audience member question is, do you support or oppose section 1022 of the NDAA, which creates the sea-based nuclear deterrence fund? Oh, I'm against that. Yeah, it's a bad budget gimmick. So I'm just against that. Yeah. They shouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, since single-payer health care insurance programs are more cost-effective uh, to deliver, uh, do you support a Medicare for All approach? Well, that is a good question. I've heard a lot of people talking about that. And I've heard people saying that comparing Medicare for All or comparing the Canadian health care system to Obamacare is like comparing apples and oranges. And I have to say, my friends. I do not understand what is the problem with comparing apples and oranges. We can do that! <laughs> <laughs> apples are red, oranges are orange. So we can do this. Thank you. All right, so jeffersonlincoln.com, please come. Uh, if, am I going to be able to come to a workshop later on today? Yes. yes. Excellent. So uh, and I don't know what room it is, but I'm sure you'll find out about it, and we will be able to You'll be able to hear more about my candidacy, and I believe that another candidate, uh, Ace Annapolis, is going to be there too. So, be great to meet you all. Thank you very much. Uh, unless you want me to say what. So, bird dogging is uh, the, the how to get your questions in with candidates and political personalities. Uh, how to write a question that can't be wriggled out of, and uh, and and how to use that. Uh, to gain your, uh, what you care about, uh, political spotlight. Okay, great. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. I'd like to limit questions or comments f to one minute. Uh, where are our microphone carrying volunteers? Uh, here comes one right now. Okay, Joseph, go ahead. Joseph, go ahead. Oh, okay. He's waiting for a microphone, poor guy. Okay. I'm not sure that one works, Mary. Um, You're not sure it works? So, so, so my, my question is for Will and for uh, Mr. Jefferson Lincoln. Um, I'd, like, I'd like you to explain how this process of bird dogging in New Hampshire has impacted the political discourse there and how people from the, this, this, this distant planet of Massachusetts might be helpful to that, that campaign to impact the discourse and the politics in New Hampshire in the presidential election. Sure. And maybe Mr. Lincoln will have something to add to this. Um, so uh, the New Hampshire gubernatorial candidates are, are currently uh, debating the height of the wall that will run along our southern border. But for the time being, <laughs> uh, folks from Massachusetts are still allowed into New Hampshire, um, where I, I'm only slightly exaggerating by having saying that six presidential candidates mobbed me on my way out of the gas station. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the, 
the questions that we're able to get in with presidential candidates in New Hampshire, where we have like seven people living, um, are <laughs> frequently the subject of national media. Um, it was a New Hampshire Peace Action member who asked uh, John McCain, uh, do you think you could have troops in Iraq for an entire eight-year tenure when John McCain then said, eight years, how about a hundred, maybe even a thousand? Um, you know, that got national press. It was on, it was the leading story on every major news outlet that night. Um, when we talk about uh, getting media, the media to pay attention to our movement, um, the presidential politics in particular are a great way to leverage leverage that. And we're we're not that far away from Massachusetts. And like I said, that wall's not up yet. So, <laughs> but ask your qu candidates questions too. Okay, someone else. Okay, Serena. Uh, okay, I have a question for the senator. Uh, could you, um, if you know this, uh, how much uh, has the military spent in the past in the past empires? Do you have an estimate? And also, does anybody know how much, uh, who are the majority owners of police and prison business that is very popular right now? And lastly, I have a, a question for Chin. Um, and I'm sorry, you might want to, could you restate that? Because I, I didn't understand oh, the, last, the question. The second question? Both, both, both of them, all okay, of them, if the you don't mind. Okay, the first one was uh, how much military spending uh, was uh, there in the past empire, and what is uh, past good what? Em empires, like the British Empire or Ottoman Empire? Okay, and well, I, I have no idea, so. Oh, okay, and how much is an acceptable amount? <laughs> why, for why would I know that? I mean. I don't know. I mean, it's, okay. we know that's 54%, so I'm just curious what is an amount that's appropriate. And also, uh, does anybody know about how much is spent on police and prison business? Who are the major uh, owners of such a business? And also for Chung, I want to know, um, how long does it start or take to start um, um, one of these uh, events going on where you talked about Nicaragua, where there was a protest uh, for the dam? And um, how- Okay, Zarina, uh, went, went to a customer. Okay, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you want to tackle any of that? Um, can we give the mic to Arnie to talk about the prison part? Oh, I mean to to Jefferson Lincoln. I mean, just, I'll be I'm back to being Arnie actually. Um, thanks. Yeah, he's gone. Thanks. Um, <laughs> one of the just to, to follow up on Joseph's question as well. We, just as an example, uh, 13 months ago, a group of high school students approached Hillary Clinton at a rope line after a speech uh, in Des Moines and asked her her opinion of private prison corporations that are making money because the federal budget mandates that 34,000 immigrants be locked up on a daily basis, and right now 60% of those are being held in private prisons. And Hillary looked at them and said, oh, that's a long question. Where do you go to school? Oh, <laughs> give me that index card. Oh, anyway, um, it's, but six months later, in her first speech to a Latino group after the campaign was underway in Las Vegas, she came out with a very strong denunciation of the immigrant detention quota and of the private prison companies that are lobbying for this type of policy. And most recently, in part because she's been getting questions from us and in part because she's been getting questions from people from Black Lives Matter, her campaign actually said that they would stop accepting contributions from the private prison industry and that money that they had taken in so far, she was going to turn over to charity. So we have succeeded in, in a sense, in driving that question about privatized prisons uh, and the role of those companies into the presidential campaign discourse in a way that you know we would not have predicted necessarily 13 months ago that that was going to happen. So that's an example of what's what's going on right now. The two biggest private prison companies are the Corrections Corporation of America and the Geo Group. Uh, there are others, but these are the ones that dominate the industry. Uh, two, well, again, 60% of the immigrants being held in private prisons are being held in facilities owned by one of those two companies. And then of all of the private prisons containing immigrants, they control about three quarters of that market. Um, so keep an eye on them, but they are not the only ones. Uh, and it's, again, it's an example of the corruption of our political and economic system that we can challenge. I'm gonna support this man for president. Um, <laughs> another, another comment or question? Okay. Hi, I'm Cleve Ray. I'm with the Boston Homeless Solidarity Committee. Uh, Congressman Eldridge, there's uh, two bills that in the uh, State House. One, Someday maybe, we'll one see. One in the Senate and one in Congress for uh, a homeless bill of rights. 
I know they're in committee. They've had public hearings. I wonder if you have any idea when they'll come out of committee and what their likelihood is of passage. So you're talking with the state legislation for homeless bill of rights? Yes. Yeah, so, so the bill is still in committee. I, I don't know the status of, of what will happen within the committee. I, I do support it, but just to, to give people an example, and I, I mentioned in my remarks, is that um, on, on the positive side, Massachusetts is one of the few states in the, in the U.S. That, that does have a right to shelter, and that if you're, if, if you're poor and, you're, and you don't have a place to live, they will pay for you to stay in a hotel or, or shelter. But what is happening under the Baker administration is they're finding different ways to deny people access to shelter. And the example I gave is this family that lost their apartment from, from, uh, from the, the apartment building being burned out, is that it, they found out that the wife had been fired from her job. And as absurd as this is, somehow that's a policy that therefore that makes you ineligible for shelter. And so uh, she is still borrowing money to, to stay in a hotel room while, while waiting for an alternative. So I, I absolutely support the bill. Um, that being said, I, I think what, what we're seeing is that administrations, and, and sadly it's not just Republican because it's happened under Democratic administrations, is that they'll, they'll find different ways to deny access to shelter. And, and that speaks to the fact that you need to um, seriously get back to uh, significant federal funding for more public housing, more uh, Section 8 vouchers, and, and other federal uh, ways to provide uh, money for affordable housing. So I'm, I'm trying to turn it back to the focus on the people's budget, but to me it <coughs> speaks to the fact that we need to get back to our priorities at the federal level to take care of our own here in Massachusetts. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Senator Eldridge, thank you for coming. Um, under the Baker administration, uh, what is his name? Uh, Patrick Duvall's administration. Duvall Patrick, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I remember that. Um, there was a bill passed under the bonding committee to lend money to help repair and replace and develop military bases. So mm -hmm. if we weren't spending enough money in our federal taxes to support the military, the state decided they ought to help the military bases here in Massachusetts to uh, try to stave off any brack, you know, if a base realignment committee came around, these uh, bases would look shiny if we had lent them money to repair their roads and such. I wondered if uh, you have heard much about whether, whether or not, how much that money was spent, if it was spent, the 100, I think it was 170 million to help the military mm -hmm. bases. Terrific question, Carol. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit, because this is an issue I work extremely closely with, with Carol, uh, with Cole, and, and all the members of Mass Peace Action last session is uh, there was an effort by the administration and many legislators to pass a, a military bond bill to spend $200 million of, of our money uh, to enhance or support military bases in Massachusetts uh, from the lens of, of economic development. And I think this is one of the more troubling aspects that really we need to ask tough questions of our politicians, both at the state and federal level, is that many politicians uh, look to the military budget through the lens of this is going to create jobs in my district, even though there's incredible evidence. I know Carol was involved in a study that showed that if we spent that money on transportation or education or things like solar, it would create many, many more jobs uh, than the jobs created through creating weapons of destruction and, 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 and research that, that contributes to the military. So the, the bond bill passed the legislature. There were, I think it was just myself and Senator Jalen who, who voted against the bond bill. Um, one of the disturbing things that I found is that I went out to my district. My district includes Fort Devens, which, which is still a military base uh, out in central Massachusetts. And I took a tour of the, of the training facility where, where a lot of people are trained to, to go off and serve overseas. And, and the training facility, uh, it's about 3,000 acres. Um, had among, among the most modern uh, facilities that I saw, certainly a lot more modern than many of the communities surrounding that military base. And, and to me, the, what struck me is that um, it, it underscored the fact that the money being set aside for military spending, even in a, a relatively s small training facility at Devons, speaks to the fact of how much money we're, we are spending in the military. And therefore, not only did we not need to spend state money in our military, which isn't even, of course, the purpose of state government, but, but also that um, it, it wasn't even necessary because there was far too much money being spent by the military on things that, with all due respect, I don't think were greatly needed. So um, that was a great effort by Mass Peace Action last session. 
obviously we, we were not successful. Uh, however, I did reach out to the Baker administration and they have not spent any of that money um, to support military bases. Really what it was is it was a, it was a message to send to the, the, the Department of Defense and the Pentagon not to close any more of our military bases. And so um, you can argue whether or not we, we should continue to have the military bases we have, but just to send a clear message is that our, our Massachusetts legislators and, and many congressmen and women still continue to believe that the presence of military bases in Massachusetts somehow contributes to the economy, when I would argue that the alternative that we're, we're proposing under the people's budget and the Mass Peace Action has fought for for years would create many, many more jobs in Massachusetts that are much more sustainable, which obviously is the point of this whole conference. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, hi, Ms. Hung, first of all, thank you so much for talking. You mentioned Palestine like really quickly when you were describing some of the work you did. Could you say a little more about that? Great. Um, so we also support social movement organizations in Palestine and um, uh, from agricultural work uh, committee to a human rights organization to women's farming projects. Um, our focus is on um, food, water, land, um, and so they, uh, those groups tend to work on those issues. Um, it's been, um, uh, 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 and I think Palestine is one of those places where both kind of the intense um, struggles around water and natural resources, um, for example, kind of, I, th I think you probably know, you know, Israelis would dig a pipe under ground and then 90 degree turn uh, uh, to Palestinian areas and just suck water out of the, the very aquifers, um, the sources. Um, uh, and then in some cases sell it back to Palestinians at a higher price and just uh, all kinds of stuff going on. Um, but our work there is a little bit different from some of the other areas. I think it's important to look at how U.S. intervention plays out differently. Sometimes it has a, 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 um, a kind of a certain pattern of, you know, backing dictators in Central America to do blah, blah, blah. In Palestine, um, uh, uh, it's a clear situation of Israeli occupation of Palestine, and so um, even as we talk about, you know, human rights or um, uh, you know all the you know the climate issues and everything, um, we really try to look at the root causes of the conflict in Palestine and say um, that unless. Um, the occupation is ended, and unless U.S. Um, stops the military aid uh, going directly to Israel, uh, none of those water rights, human rights issues are going to be solved fundamentally. So thank you for asking about that. They're actively talking about, um, President Obama is actively talking about giving $45 billion, which is a huge step up from what was already, already outrageous, $30 billion. So he wants to give $45 billion for the next 10 years in military aid, and um, we just, we have to stop that, and that has to be part of the big peace movement here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, so that's the last question. Um, I want to thank our panel. Thank you to Jamie, Chung-Wa, Will, and Senator Jefferson.